So welcome to NOAA Live. We are so glad to be back. My name is Nicole Bartlett, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. NOAA Live webinars will be offered most Wednesdays during this school year at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. To get more information, just visit the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education page or follow us on Facebook. Now, this series is designed to help you go know, get to know NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and some of our incredible experts. Today, we're introducing you to my good friend, Jeff Orock, with the National Weather Service in Wakefield, Virginia. While we're gonna be talking about weather balloons today, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of native communities who have sub substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Jeff is coming to us from the land of the Nottaway Indian tribe of Virginia, and we're hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead Aquina. A few guidelines, reminders, before I hand you over to our speaker, you're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we make, wanna make sure you can hear Jeff. There is a box where you can write questions. You can find that right now and let me know if you haven't already where you're calling in from. And we encourage you to ask those questions as you go and I will keep track of them. And then when we pause um, in Jeff's presentation, I'll have, I will help him answer a few of those questions. So we'll relay those to him. Um, we may not get to everyone, but we will try to answer as many as we can. All right, that's it from me, Jeff. You ready to go? We're ready. All right, here we go. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Mr. Jeff. There's a picture of me there in the upper left-hand corner. I'm in my National Weather Service office here in Wakefield, Virginia. Um, you can see I'm surrounded by a lot of computers, and, and we'll talk more about that. As you heard Nicole say, I'm, I'm from Virginia, so sitting right out here really in the eastern part of the state, um, not too far from, from the ocean there. So gives you a nice map of Virginia and exactly where, where we are sitting right now, where we're coming to you from. Uh, as far as a little bit about me, you know, why people always ask, how do you get into weather and meteorology? Well, you know, I grew up here in Virginia near the beach. And of course, you know, when I was little, I grew up surfing and I love to go surfing a lot. And as I got older, you know, middle school and high school, you know, realize that the waves were caused by the weather. And, and so really started studying the weather patterns and what was going on, and that would make the waves. And that's that way I knew when to go surfing by watching the weather. Now, of course, like a lot of you guys, you know, I love to watch storms. I'd run to the window and watch a thunderstorm. Um, went through a lot of hurricanes here in Virginia because we are on the ocean. And so that really got my interest um, in meteorology. And the bottom right hand corner picture there is just from uh, earlier this summer where I go on the water a lot, spend a lot of time fishing with the family and going to the beach. So I'm always watching the weather because I want to know when I can go outside. Now people ask, what do we study for meteorology? And biggest things that we study the most are science and math. Science is the fun stuff. That's where we get to do all the experiments and test different theories and try to figure out, you know, really how things work. But you can't have science without math. And that's just one thing I wanted to mention that all of the science that we do with weather balloons and forecasting and the radar, all of that is actually based in math. So when you're going into any kind of science, just make sure you keep up with your math and do good in your math classes. All right, so talking about weather balloons today and wanted to kind of talk just quickly about the history. How long have we been trying to figure out what the atmosphere is doing over top of our heads? You know, and going back, you know, even into the 1700s, you see a picture here of 1790 in Europe. You know, everybody recognized that the weather we see here at the ground comes from above our heads. You know, rain comes from the clouds and lightning and everything's coming from our from the clouds. And it's all above our heads. And so early scientists you know, wanted to try to figure out what was going on over our heads. And the first thing they had that they could use were kites. And so they would tie thermometers and things like that onto a kite and they would fly the kite as high as they could. And they would take a temperature reading and they tried to get it down real quick and see what the temperature was. And so it was really simple and kind of crude. 
Um, you guys might remember somebody famous in history who flew a kite. He had a key on it and he was studying electricity. And you guys might remember that was Benjamin Franklin that did that. And he flew that kite up near a thunderstorm to kind of learn more about electricity in the atmosphere. Um, and so we've used kites. As balloons came on to the into history where we had bigger balloons and balloons that could fly higher in the atmosphere than kites, uh, we started attaching weather instruments to balloons um, in about the 1800s. And a lot of cases, people rode the balloons. They'd hang in a basket beneath the balloon. They'd have a lot of weather instruments and they would fly with the balloon and write down the weather as they as they could see it on their instruments. Um, nowadays, by the time we got into you know the 1960s and things like that, computers came on the scene. And so now we have computerized small instruments that we still attach to balloons and we let them go. And then we get all the information back here um, at the weather offices. But we've been measuring the atmosphere for a long time when we, you know, throughout history. So what do you guys think weather balloons measure? Um, we, we have these fancy weather balloons. We'll talk more about the instrument here in a second. But what do you guys think that we're actually trying to measure in the atmosphere with our balloon? I think Nicole was gonna help me out with some answers. Okay, this is Nicole from the chat box. Just, can you hear me all right, Jeff? Yes? Yeah, I okay. hear you great. All right, so let's see. Um, we, Sloan thinks temperature, um, and so does Juan. I have, to, I have to give a special shout out to Juan because Juan was the one who requested that we do weather balloons. So he attended a lot of these webinars in the spring. So make sure you, um, if he gets a question, we'll have to make sure we answer his. He thinks they measure temperature in the atmosphere. Um, Luke and uh, let's see, Texas both say pressure. Um, I think that's pretty good. I don't think I knew what pressure was at that age. Uh, wind, says Clark. Um, anybody else have any guesses? All right, that's what we got right now, Jeff. Were any of them right? Yeah, I mean, pretty much you got all the big ones. Um, temperature and pressure. Those are the two big ones. We'll talk more about that. But yeah, the pressure, um, as the balloon glows up, the pressure gets less and less, and it's measuring how fast the pressure decreases as you go higher. Uh, temperature, you know, measuring how hot or cold the air is. Uh, one thing that we measured th that is humidity, and we'll talk more about that, but that, that has to do with moisture, which makes clouds and rainfall. And then there's your wind. Uh, we hear a lot of folks talk about wind, wind speed. And of course, it's also measuring altitude, but that's also related to pressure. So uh, the big ones, yeah, air pressure, temperature, wind speed, and then throw in humidity, um, the moisture in the atmosphere. And we'll talk about why that's so important here uh, in a little while. And so why, you know, why weather balloons? Well, long story short, you know, here's a, my picture of my weather office here in the brick building. But, you know, we're sitting inside a building. So we've got to know what the weather is doing outside and above our heads. So we launched the weather balloons to forecast hurricanes, tornadoes to do special forecasts for pilots because they need to know where the clouds are, how thick the clouds are, if it's foggy. Um, we need to know if it's going to snow or if it's just going to be rain because it's all the weather's coming from above our heads. And you've heard a lot about the fires out in California and out in the western part of the United States. And some of you guys are closer to the fires and smoke than I am here in Virginia. But the weather balloons are important for that because the weather really drives and steers the fire and it can actually depend upon you know if the weather is a certain way it can make the fire grow really quickly or it can actually help put the fire out and so weather balloons are really critical especially out there to try to figure out what are the fires going to do and that's been a big thing you know here in the news so here's my friend uh, Brandon bringing a weather balloon out, getting ready to uh, take it for a launch. And so we'll talk about the different pieces um, of the weather balloon. But one thing you notice is how big it is. I mean, the balloon's about almost six feet across. It's bigger than my friend Brandon. Um, if, he could, if he could do it, he could actually crawl inside that thing because uh, the balloon is so big. But the balloon is actually filled with gas. And there's two different gases that we use. And some folks might know what it is. And, Maybe I'll pause for just a second, Nicole, to see if folks might guess. There's only, there's two gases we can put in the balloon. I can pause just a quick second if you want to see if somebody can guess what the what a gas might be that we put in there to make so, it the balloon rise. Yeah, so we do have a couple of guesses. This is Nicole. 
And it looks like uh, Luke thinks hydrogen. Uh, Juan thinks helium and hydrogen. Uh, Edia says helium. Katya says helium. Clark says helium. Texas says hydrogen or helium. So I think they might be onto something. Yeah, and they're all right. Um, we use both gases. We use both hydrogen and helium. Um, depending on how the building is set up, uh, we do use both gases because they're both lighter than air and they allow the balloon to rise. So those were those were great guesses. You guys know exactly what's going on with these weather balloons. So these are the parts of it. These are the pieces that make up really the entire weather balloon. Um, we have the balloon itself, the big rubber part that you see there that we blow up with helium and hydrogen. Then the orange piece of plastic over here is a parachute. And so that is made so that when the balloon pops, um, the parachute opens up and allows the whole balloon and the instrument to float back down to the ground really slowly. Um, and so that's what we have the parachute for. And we use a lot of string. We use about 75 feet of string. And then at the end of that 75 feet of string is the weather instrument itself. And the weather instrument is called, it's what it looks like. And I'm going to take one apart for you here in just a second. And we call it a radio sonde. Um, and so radio means it's a transmitter. It's transmitting a signal. And sonde is the French word for probe. So it's a radio probe. Um, it's a radio sonde. And so that's, that's what we officially call these little weather instruments. And so I'm going to stop my screen and hope my sharing. And hopefully you can see me. Can you see me okay, Nicole? Yes, you are perfect. All right, so we're going to try to dissect one of these little weather instruments. This is this is what it looks like. Um, and there's a couple different versions of these. This is one of the versions that we use. It's not very big. You can you can see the size of it, and it's got some simple uh, sensors on it. And so what you see here, the most one of the most important things, you see this little ball, and I can try to hold it up a little bit. There's a teeny little little metal ball above my fingers. It's just a teeny little thing right there. That's our thermometer, and that's what's measuring the temperature. Is that tiny ball? It's the exact same thing if you had your parents bring a the digital thermometer and they stick it under your tongue. If you look at that thermometer, it'll have a little teeny metal ball, just like you're seeing right, right there, um, a teeny little metal ball at the very tip of the thermometer. And so this uses electrical current um, and it measures the temperature. It's really hard to see this next one. It's a little teeny white, and this one's tough, a um, little teeny white microchip. It's sitting right here. It's really, really small. Um, that's measuring the moisture in the atmosphere. So as this goes up, that can tell you, is it dry? Is it is it cloudy? Is, is the air, atmosphere you know, really saturated? How much moisture is there? Um, and so the temperature sensor and the, their dew point sensor are just sticking on this little probe that comes off of our instrument. Now you see this little blue antenna down here at the bottom. In the blue antenna, that's the radio signal. So that's what's sending the signal back down to Earth. And then as this thing moves and flies through the atmosphere, the computer knows what direction it's moving and how fast. And so that's how it knows what the wind is doing. Because if it's moving really slow, then the wind's light. If it's moving quick, the wind is really strong. And so it tracks it and then it knows what the wind is doing. So we'll dissect this thing here a little bit more. We'll pull it out of its little case. And so the silver box that you see here, this is going to getting inside the weather instrument. The silver box is our, is our barometer. That's our pressure cell. And so there's, a, there's little uh, circuits in there that measure what the pressure is. So that's our pressure cell and our temperature sensor sticking way out here um, out the front. Now, if I pull it apart if even more, continue to dissect this thing you'll see the back of it and it just looks like almost like a little teeny computer. Uh, just lots of little circuits there that help drive everything, that collect all the weather instrument data and, and send it then send it back through the antenna back down to the weather office. But that's the inside of it. Looks like if you took your, don't do it, but if you took one of your little computers apart, you might see a lot of, a lot of little circuits like that. Now, if you notice there's a battery plug here, so something has to power it. Let me pull this out. Just like a little nine volt, like you would typically see at home. If you're powering one of your little uh, toy or if you're powering a, a, a game or something like that. Um, and so that plugs into a special battery. And so we have a little battery here and it's in a little baggie um, and it's got the plug on it too. It's not a battery like you have at home. It's, it's actually a much weaker battery, um, but it, it powers, it looks like this and we have to soak it in water and it's not, and that activates it. It creates the acid. 
that activates the battery. And this is what powers our weather instrument. So these are really the guts um, inside um, our weather instrument. And this is what's making, you know, collecting all the data and then sending it back down to Earth. One thing that's neat about this is once it pops and comes back down to the Earth, inside the box with the weather balloon, if you if you find one and you say you find it in the, in the field or something, you can go inside of it and pull this baggie out. You can put it's a little baggie. You pull it out of the inside of the weather instrument, and when you unroll it, you realize you can put it back in this bag and mail it back to the weather service and we can fix it back up and use it again. So we do get some of our weather balloons back. They go up, they pop, they float back down to earth. People find them and then they can mail them back to us. So really pretty neat, but that's the guts and pieces of our weather balloon. And we'll think we're gonna stop there um, and take a few questions that you guys might have. All right, so this is Nicole from the chat box here. Um, so we did have a question. Um, and I think a few of the questions that we got, and I know you're about to get to, so I'm going to hold off on those, but somebody, um, let's see, who was it that asked this? So Luke wants to know, how much does the radio sound weigh? Uh, that's a good question. It is, it is very, very light. Um, really the heaviest part of the, of the weather instrument is the balloon. Um, but once you put the gas in the balloon, the balloon then like, then lifts up. But you know, if I was to hold the, this is the balloon, this is actually a lot heavier than the weather instrument. The weather instrument is is got to be about a pound or even or even maybe a little bit less. It's very very light. The only weight to it is really just that circuit board. And if I weigh these two, the balloon is a lot heavier, but the balloon's going to be full of helium and hydrogen, and it's going to lift up anyway. But they're really really light because it's just a thin little piece of plastic, really. Do they? Um, and so let's see. That's Nicole again. Um, Luke wants to know how often do they break? Because they do seem like pretty delicate instruments. Yeah, the instrument, so the balloon pops every time you send it up, um, and we'll talk about that. These weather instruments, you know, they're actually inside the styrofoam case. And so, you know, they're inside this nice protective case, um, and they, they, they go up through the atmosphere, and then when, they, when the balloon pops, the parachute allows it to float back down to the ground, so they don't hit very hard. Um, and so, a lot of times, if, if people find them, um, they can be reused. Um, they don't they don't usually get damaged too bad because um, they're light, um, and then when they fall, they don't hit the ground very hard. Wow, that's really cool. Okay, this is Nicole again. So, one more question. Uh, Juan wants to know: Do you put all of that together by hand? How are the radio sounds assembled? Yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about next is we'll actually have a video uh, showing how we assemble it. But yeah, everybody uh, that does this, uh, it blows up the balloon by hand um, and they tie everything together with string. Um, and so we do this twice a day and, and it's we have different people. This is their job and they come in and they launch the weather balloons. So it's uh, just to clarify, this is Nicole again, uh, is the radio sound also assembled by hand by somebody? Or does that come to you That's already packaged up? Right, so this comes already packaged. So the actual weather sensor, the radio sound itself, which I've taken it out of the box now, but that already comes already packaged. Um, we just have to blow up the balloon and tie the balloon to the parachute and the parachute to the radio sound. Okay, I've got, um, and let me, let me give you, this Nicole again from the chat box, giving a question from Clark before we move on. I'm sorry, it's Ruth. Ruth wants to know if they're sending weather balloons into Hurricane Delta. So they are doing something a little bit different. And the, the, the answer is yes. But instead of a weather balloon going up, um, an airplane, the hurricane hunter flies into the hurricane. And they're dropping, they're not exactly like this, um, but they're dropping similar instruments um, out the back of the airplane. And it does have a parachute on it. And it floats down through the hurricane to, to, to the surface of the ocean. And so, those are called drop sons because they're dropping, uh, but it's a very similar type of instrument that they shoot out of the back of the Hurricane Hunter plane. And so they are they are putting instruments in the hurricane, but instead of balloons going up, they're drop sons coming down, but they're very, very similar. Good question. Right. Good, I think we're gonna pause there and let you continue. All right, turn my screen back on. I hope you're seeing the right screen again. I'll just double check with you, Nicole. I'm looking at a question 
screen. Yep. All right. So we talked about the weather balloon and, and what it's kind of made up of. And there's a special we call it a balloon shelter. And so this is a picture of the weather service office. Um, the real tall ball in the backyard here, that's the radar tower. So that's what's tracking all the thunderstorms. But the smaller building here in the front with the white dome that has the big door on it, um, that's our actual, we call it the balloon shelter. And inside this white dome and the balloon shelter is a tracking antenna. And so when we release the weather balloon and the weather balloon is sending the signal back to us, we have to track it as there's a special system that follows the balloon. And that way we know where it's going and how fast it's moving and we're getting all the data from it. Um, and so we do all that in our, in our balloon shelter. And the door is so big here, you see the big door, because remember the balloon is big and we've got to get the balloon from outside the building. We blow it up inside the building and then we bring it outside to let go of it so it can fly. So we need a big door to get this big balloon out. But this is called our balloon shelter. And so everywhere that we're releasing a weather balloon, we've got these special buildings with these special antennas um, to track the weather balloons as they fly through the atmosphere. And so here's our weather balloon. It's all ready to go. Uh, we see the weather balloon is all blown up here with uh, our helium, let's say. You see the string, you got the parachute laying on the ground here, and then a whole lot more string. And it's really hard to see it, but you see the weather instrument, the, the actual radio sign sitting on the table. And so what I'll do is I'll actually show you guys a video um, of what it looks like uh, when this weather balloon goes up. So just give me just a quick second and we'll show you guys a video of what it looks like. All right, so here's our balloon. You should be seeing it. Um, this is where they're blowing it up with either helium or hydrogen. Um, we have a table here that we work from and you see the parachute sitting there. Everything's just waiting to be tied together. And then there's our uh, guy basically tying the uh, parachute to the bottom of the balloon. So the balloon's all inflated. And so he's got to tie the parachute to it so that when the balloon pops, you know, it'll float back down to the ground. And then he goes inside and there's our weather instrument. That's our radio sign. And he's putting the battery into it. That way we, it has power. And then once we uh, hook the battery up and we know it has power, um, what he'll do is, is he'll actually hook it up to the computer. So there he is. And the radio sounds transmitting weather information even right now. As soon as you plug it in, it starts working. And so he's got it sitting there next to the computer just to make sure that it's working right. Now, once we know that it's working right and everything is good, um, he's got to carry the weather instrument from inside the weather office to the balloon shelter. And then he's got to make one final little, little knot here, and he's tying the uh, weather balloon to the weather, to the radio sign, to the instrument. And so he's got it all tied together. He's got the weather balloon, the parachute, and then the instrument. And so once he's ready to go, he carries it outside. And it's a long string. The, the instrument's way over here, way in the background, hanging on a stick. You see, that's the weather instrument. There's the balloon. You see the parachute in his hand. And he's also holding the instrument um, in his hand. And when he lets go, it goes fast. It leaves us really, really quickly. Watch him go. There it goes. And remember, it's sending back the weather information right away. It's the weather instrument is transmitting um, as soon as we plug it in. And then he goes back into the weather office and we can see the information coming back to us. So he makes sure the data looks good, um, that we're getting good data. And then the data from our weather instrument comes right into our forecast system. So we can see exactly what the atmosphere is doing above our heads, I mean, right away. We get the information immediately. And we'll talk about how that helps us to forecast. So here's kind of a last release in slow motion. You see him let the balloon go and it takes off fast. It goes really, really quickly. The weather instrument's tied up down there. You just can't see it, it's so small, but you can definitely see how big that balloon is. All right, I'll go ahead and close the video and should be able to reshare my screen. All right, all right, I'll just double check with Nicole, make sure we're back. You are. You are. All right. Yeah, so that, that was our weather balloon launch and it all starts right here in the shelter um, where they actually, they put everything together. 
And so with that, we will actually take another quick break here for some questions to see if you guys have any questions about the, the launch and what goes on when we're putting everything together. Okay, uh, this is Nicole from the chat box. So we do have a few questions. Uh, the, let's see, I think it's Sierra wants to know how long was that string? That looked pretty long. It is, so from the bottom of the balloon, all the way to the instrument is about 75 feet. Um, we have about 75 feet of string total um, that, that we, when we were tying it together. So from the balloon to the parachute, that's about maybe eight to 10 feet. And then the rest of the length goes from the parachute all the way down to the instrument. The reason why it's so long is you want the instrument to be pretty far away from the weather balloon. The reason for that is as the balloon goes higher in the atmosphere, it's going to expand and it's going to get a lot bigger and eventually that balloon will be almost the size of let's say your school bus and then it will pop and so you want the weather instrument to be pretty far away from the balloon so that the balloon doesn't mess up the readings great this is nicole again from the chat box jessica would like to know and i i heard this but i'm not sure if anybody caught it how often do you send up weather balloons Mm -hmm. So we send them up twice a day. We send them up once in the morning and again in the evening. And I have a slide to show you how many places we launch it from. And what's really neat is we use something called Zulu time. So it's Greenwich Mean Time. And so everybody in weather across the entire globe uses the same time. We call it Greenwich Mean Time. And that way we all launch weather balloons at the exact same time uh, from everywhere at this it's really really neat at the same time so uh, it's twice a day for us it's once in the morning on the east coast and once in the evening but in other places around the world it, it'll vary um, because we use we call what's called zulu time great thank you jeff that's a great answer this is nicole again from the chat box has tegan wants to know has the balloon ever been struck by lightning you know that's a good question and you know, I don't know 100%, but I would think for sure they, they, they would be because as they're going up, um, if they get near a thunderstorm or they get near something that's really electrified cloud, you know, it will help to make a channel that will allow a, a discharge to occur. So I'm sure that a balloon has been hit by lightning before um, and popped before it was supposed to just because of the nature of the atmosphere. You know, we launch these balloons you know, from all these different locations. And sometimes they are gonna fly near thunderstorms or in thunderstorms. So I am sure we've had weather balloons uh, get struck by lightning. All right, this is Nicole again from the chat box. Juan would like to know, are there different colors of weather balloons? Or are they all brown? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, um, so this one's kind of a, uh, they, sometimes they'll be a white, the kind of a whitish brown. That's the one I showed you. Um, sometimes they're really dark brown. Um, and then there are other weather balloons um, that are launched that almost look like a red. Um, those are some special weather balloons that, that folks will track with like a telescope. Um, so there are different color weather balloons. The ones that we use that we're talking about today are almost all like a, a light brown or a dark brown. Uh, but you will sometimes see other color weather balloons that'll be really white. And also sometimes we use red. Okay, I, th I know you have some more stuff to cover, so I'm going to hold the rest of those questions for a few minutes till we get to the next break. Okay, all right, very good. So we talked about the weather balloon, we talked about you know, the instrument, and we saw a video of, of, of the balloon going up. So, you know, y'all have studied the atmosphere. So how high does the weather balloon really go before it pops? And what you see here, our weather balloon goes up, it gets up into the really the second layer of the atmosphere, um, the troposphere is where we live and the troposphere is where all the uh, rain occurs that's where all the clouds are that's the air that we breathe and so we live in the lowest layer of the atmosphere right near the ground the next layer above that's called the stratosphere and the weather balloon will go all the way into the stratosphere and then eventually it'll pop because what happens is as you go higher and higher in the atmosphere there's less and less pressure around the balloon and so the balloon's got to equalize the pressure so to do that, the balloon has to expand and it stretches and it gets huge. We just talked about it gets the size of a school bus and then it pops and then it comes back down to the ground. 
And so it doesn't quite make it to space, but it gets up pretty high, um, just below the mesosphere. The mesosphere is the next layer up in the atmosphere, then eventually the thermosphere. So weather balloons go all the way through the troposphere, and then really just about most of the way through the stratosphere, if it's a really good balloon launch. But the layer that we're trying to measure the most is the troposphere, because remember, we, that's where the temperature and the moisture is that's causing our weather and the wind. So we're really measuring the troposphere when we launch our weather balloons. Now, if I could actually attach a camera, there was a camera attached to a weather balloon. They launched it all the way up um, until it actually started to pop. As the balloon went up, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It grows and it gets to the point where it just can't get any larger and then it pops. And if you could ride on a weather balloon or attach a camera, this is what it would look like right before it pops. You're up at about 90,000 feet. So you're up really high. You see the earth with most of its atmosphere, the, the troposphere down below here in the blue. And then above you, it gets, it's really dark. There's, there's not much atmosphere at all. And you're really starting to see space. And so kind of a neat picture here um, from the weather balloon right when it pops, showing you how high up you are in the atmosphere. And that's at 90,000 feet, which is up pretty high, well into the stratosphere. So we know the balloons go up really high. Um, and then as they go up through the atmosphere, eventually they pop. Once they pop, the parachute deploys and it floats back down to the ground. So how long does a weather balloon flight last? Well, from when we let it go to when it pops is about two hours. It takes about two hours to go from the ground to let's say about 90 to 90,000 feet or so. So it has a two hour flight. Now, because the wind is blowing it, it, but depending on how strong the wind is, the weather balloon, if it's not much wind at all, the weather balloon may not travel very far. But if there's a lot of wind in the atmosphere above our heads, it could travel over 100 miles. So I could launch it from here and it could land over 100 miles away by the time it pops and floats back down to the ground. So how far the balloon travels is really dependent upon the wind, but they can travel pretty far. And what's neat about the weather balloons, everyone has a special number to it. When we turn it on, we actually write it into the database what the balloon number is. And so if someone finds that balloon and mails it back, we can tell what weather service office it was launched from and what time it was launched. So we can go back in time and figure out where did this balloon come from um, that you just found. So that's really pretty neat. So we get all this data from the weather balloons. We talked about temperature and we talked about the humidity. So the temperature as the balloon goes up, it gets getting colder and colder um, as you get higher and higher in the atmosphere. Um, and it's also measuring the winds. We talked about this, uh, the blue arrows here represent the wind. The red line represents the temperature. So this is the balloon telling us what the temperature is. Uh, the, the blue line is, is, is the moisture. So the red is temperature, the blue is moisture. And we call that the dew point. So it's measuring the dew point. Now, what's really neat is when we see the red and blue lines getting close together, like right here, that means the temperature and the dew point are, are almost the same. So that means the air is really, really humid. And so when the air gets really humid, what do you expect to form? You expect clouds. And so when we see the red line and the temperature and the blue line and the dew point getting really close together, it means the air is almost saturated, and so we expect clouds. Now, further up, and that's moist air. Now, farther up, you notice here the red and the blue lines are way far apart. And so when you see a big separation between the temperature and the dew point, that means the air is really, really dry. And this photograph here is probably a really good example of what the atmosphere probably looked like when this weather balloon was launched. The weather balloon went up. It went through the clouds that weren't too high up in the atmosphere. And so you see the moist air here where the purple arrow is. And then as it went higher up, it hit dry air. And if you look above this thin layer of clouds, you see a lot of blue sky. And so this was probably very similar to what this weather balloon you know, would have sampled when it, when it went up through the atmosphere. But it shows you an example here of temperature and our, our moisture, which is we call it the dew point. And that's our dry air above the moist air. Now, this is really important too when it's winter weather. And so we have to know what the temperature is in the clouds and right below the clouds. And so if the cloud is freezing and has snow in it, we need to know as the weather balloon goes up, 
you know, is the air beneath the clouds cold enough where the snow can make it all the way to the ground? Or is there just enough warm air in the atmosphere that as the snow falls, it's gonna get above freezing? You see, this looks like a little nose sticking out here. We call this a warm nose. And so the air is just warm enough. It's just above freezing here and it's allowing our snowfall to melt. So it's kind of a bummer. Um, it's snowing in the cloud, but it's melting before it hits the ground. And so weather balloons are really important to tell us whether it's gonna be snow hitting the ground, whether it's going to be rain hitting the ground, or freezing rain. And if we don't have weather balloons, you know, launching into the atmosphere, we don't know what those temperatures are and we don't know how the snow or rain is going to behave. And that's another reason why weather balloons are so important. So we did talk about we launch weather balloons all across the country. And what you see here is, is the red and blue lines. The red's temperature, the blue line is your moisture. And notice that each one of these cities where we launch the weather balloon, all these look different. None of these lines look the same. And that's because the weather is different at every location. And that's why it's important to launch the weather balloons across the entire country because the weather is different from, you know, say, Virginia to South Dakota to Texas to Hawaii. Um, we all have different weather over us right now. And the weather balloons capture that and they tell us what the weather's doing at all these different locations. And not only do we launch them over the United States and everywhere we have a weather service office, but we also launch weather balloons really worldwide. So we launch about 92 of them um, in the United States, which includes Hawaii, uh, Puerto Rico, Alaska. That's what the National Weather Service launches, about 92. But we're not the only ones. There are over 900 weather balloons launched worldwide twice a day. Um, and so everywhere you see these blue dots, that's where weather balloons are launched. So there's a lot of them. And what that does is it gives the meteorologist a snapshot of what the atmosphere looks like across the entire world twice a day. And then once we know what the weather looks like now, we can try to forecast what it's going to do into the future. So that's why it's so important. But that's a lot of balloons um, going up every day. And we'll stop there for some questions. All right, this is Nicole from the chat box. We got some great questions, Jeff, and I'm not sure how much content you have left to cover, but we're almost at time. So um, you might wanna think about what we wanna quickly move through if we run out of time yeah, here. It's um, just about the weather, we can go through it quick. Okay, um, so Texas, who is um, coming from Colorado, asked the question that I'm sure a lot of kids are thinking about right now. How can they find out whether there's a leather a weather balloon launch near them okay that's a really good question and there's a couple different ways you can do it um, there is a really neat website um, if you want to check it out it's called jetstream weather school um, and, and in jetstream weather school they talk about the atmosphere and there's a whole section that talks about weather balloons in the jetstream weather school and you can actually see a map of all the different locations where they launch the weather balloons. I mean, a lot more about the weather balloons, but it's called Jetstream Weather School. Um, and it's part of the National Weather Service. And they have a lot of good information about more about weather balloons in every place where they're launched. Great. This is Nicole from the chat box. Thank you, Jeff. That's perfect. And Texas, we'll make sure that we get that up on the website so that your parents um, We'll be able to find that easily um, and for the rest of you guys too. So um, let's see, Katya, Katya and Michelle are very concerned about airplanes and weather balloons colliding. Can you say mm -hmm. anything about that? No, and that's, so that's the reason why everybody launches weather balloons at the same time everywhere. So there's a couple things we do to keep airplanes safe. Um, anytime they're launching a weather balloon near the airport, and if there is an airport nearby, they contact the tower and the tower knows they're about to launch the weather balloon and the, they make sure the planes know. Um, but they're launched at the same time, so the every single day. So the pilots know exactly when and where the balloons are gonna be launched. And in the pictures that I showed you, if you notice the parachute was orange. And the reason why the parachute was bright orange is so, so that pilots can see that. Uh, see the weather balloon, uh, but we really never had any problems with planes running into weather balloons. It's it's a good question, and you know the reason why we launch them at the same time and we have air, air, air parachutes on them, you know, it helps keep the plane safe. All right, one quick final question from Clark and Ruth in Houston. 
they want to know whether kids are allowed to make and release their own weather balloons and what they can do to set up a weather lab at their house. Um, so the trick is trying to get the weather balloon back or trying to get the information from the weather balloon. Um, you know, you can blow up a balloon with helium or hydrogen and you could tie a thermometer or something to it um, and you could let it go and it will, it'll measure the temperature. Uh, but then the problem is you can't, how do you get it back? Um, in the old days, that's how weather balloons started. They would actually attach a thermometer to it um, and they would let it go. And then they try to figure out where it popped and try to find and try to find the thermometer so they could read how cold it, it actually got. Um, but you can kind of make your own weather balloon, you know, just by blowing up a balloon with some helium and tying something to it and let it go. Um, but it's hard to figure out what's actually happening. Now you can make your own home weather station. You know, you can make your own thermometers. And um, I know there's another cool website called SciJinx. Uh, so I know I'm plugging some websites, but we talked about Jetstream Weather School. There's another website called SciJinx. That's another NOAA a portal. And I believe they have activities for all different types of weather. And they tell you how to build your own ho home weather station. Um, and so there's all different types of home weather stations, whether you want to build one or if your parents actually uh, end up buying a weather station that you can uh, play with and actually track the weather. Uh, but NOAA SciJinx, I believe, has a lot of those really cool uh, activities that you can uh, that you can do. All right, let's stop there so you can get through your final couple of slides. Sure. So we talked about the temperatures and stuff. And the last thing we'll talk about is the wind and the weather patterns, because you guys have studied this. So. When the weather balloon goes up, we talked about how it measures the temperatures, but it's also measuring the winds in the atmosphere. And it goes up so high, uh, the weather balloons get caught up in the jet stream and they tell us where the jet stream is in the atmosphere. And this is a fast moving river of air that's way above our heads, like 10 to 12 miles high. And the reason why the jet stream is so important is that's what pushes the weather along across the entire globe. So it moves the weather from Hawaii to California to Texas to eventually the East Coast. And so we have to know what the winds are doing up there and where, you know, where it wiggles, it kind of wiggles and dips and goes up and down. And where the jet stream goes up like this, goes up to the north, you get high pressure. Where it dips down, you get low pressure. And so it's really important to know what the jet streams are doing because that's what drives our high and low pressure systems. And I know that's what you guys have studied in school, the high pressure with the sinking air coming down to the ground, the air blows out of the high pressure, low pressure pulling all the air in, it's lifting the air up. And so high pressure and low pressure create the wind that we feel and actually the weather that we experience. So the wind blows from the high pressure to the low pressure, High pressure blows clockwise, low pressure counterclockwise. And because in high pressure, the air is sinking, you get clear skies. And in low pressure, because the air is going up and it's pulling up moisture and that moisture condenses into clouds, that's where you get all your thunderstorms and rain is around low pressure. And so the balloons are helping us measure that and figure out where the high pressure systems are, where the low pressure systems are and how strong they are and how the jet stream is moving these high and low pressure systems around. So it all starts to come together. Now here's our weather map, and we have high pressure and low pressure, and the high pressure clockwise spin is pushing cold air from the south, from the north to the south, and then you have warm air coming out of the Gulf of Mexico ahead of that. And so what ends up happening is weather balloons are being launched across the country. And so, you know, where we have cold air and, and warm air hitting together, um, that's where we get a lot of showers and thunderstorms. We get this collision of air masses. And so what happens is we get what's called fronts. And you guys have probably studied this, the cold front where the cold air is coming in, replacing the warm air. When it hits, the warm air goes up. It can create a lot of showers and thunderstorms. But what's important about the weather balloons is we launch weather balloons on either side of the front. So some of the weather balloons go up in the cold air and tell us how strong and fast the cold air is moving and other weather balloons will go up in the warm air. And that'll tell us how warm is it, how much moisture is there for thunderstorms, and how bad might those thunderstorms be um, when, those, when the cold front gets there. So weather balloons are being launched and they're capturing both sides of the front. We launch weather balloons sometimes nearby thunderstorms, and that also tells us how bad the thunderstorms are going to be. So if we're expecting thunderstorms today and we launch weather balloons this morning, that weather balloon will be able to tell me could we have big hail? Are we gonna get a lot of lightning? Is it gonna be really heavy rain or just a little bit of rain? Or could there even be tornadoes? 
weather balloons are telling us what's happening above our heads where the storm's going to form. And so it's important for thunderstorms um, just like anything else. And our warm front is, remember if you've studied this, is just the opposite of the cold front. Here we have the cold air leaving and the warm air is coming back in. So, you know, basically the warm air is taking over. And again, we have the weather balloons going up on the warm side. So we know how much moisture and how much uh, heat there is. And the weather balloons are also going up in the cold air, telling us how deep is the cold air and what temperature are the clouds. And remember that's important because if the clouds are frozen and it's frozen all the way down to the ground, we could actually get snow um, on, in, in the cold air where the moisture is. So. When we're launching these weather balloons, you guys studied the high pressure and the low pressure and maybe even the jet stream. And I know you studied fronts in school. So the weather balloons are capturing all of that and measuring our weather systems and how strong they are. And that was the end, Nicole. That actually just kind of tried to tie together weather balloons to the actual weather maps that the that folks may be studying at home. That's great, Jeff. Let me get myself back on camera here so we can um see each other again great thank you so much um so i let's see so you answered the weather lab question we talked about that and we'll make sure again that those resources are up on the website for you guys um i had a feeling this question was going to come we talked about this beforehand so what do we know about um Brittany wants to know what happens if the balloon lands in the ocean we know that the the, the earth is mostly water. So the chances are some of these balloons are landing in the ocean. Do you wanna say anything about that? Yeah, so the the, the, the rubber that you see here, the, the rubber balloon itself, when it pops, it, it disintegrates. And so there really isn't anything left of this at all. Um, this really completely just almost just gets destroyed. Um, you might have a little piece of rubber here that's left over with the nozzle um, and it actually degrades. This is not a high grade rubber. It it, it it's going to degrade and disappear fairly quickly. Uh, the parachutes that we use, the plastic, it's also a really thin uh, biodegradable type of plastic. So it's not going to last too long either. It's, it's going to basically, the sun and the ocean are going to dissolve that thing. Uh, the string, um, it's, it, it also dissolves eventually and it doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't last too long. We have had boaters um, actually pick up weather balloons that have been out there fishing. Uh, I used to work along the coast and from time to time, we would get a call from somebody who's out there fishing um, and they saw a weather balloon in, uh, floating. And usually it was a weather balloon that we just launched maybe a day or two ago and they would bring it back in. But they actually start to um, just disappear and, 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 and dissolve over time. They don't, they don't last too long. Well, I also read that, um, how do you say the name of the company who makes them, the Finnish company? Is it? There's a couple different one. There's Vaisala and there's a couple other um, companies that make weather balloons too. Yeah, so I think the one you showed was from Vaisala and I read that they supply meteorological meteorological equipment to about 150 countries and they're always looking for ways to have less of an environmental impact um, with their instruments for that reason. So um, one final question from Juan in Virginia, since we own one, how much do the balloons cost? In other words, what's the the overall cost of one of these instruments? That is a good question. And I want to say I heard that the, the cost, you could try to Google it if you want to, Nicole, but I want to say the cost of a weather balloon is, is just under $100 or right around $100. Um, that may have been uh, some time ago, but I remember thinking back in my head, I want to say maybe it was right around. And, that, and some of that's the gas too. It's not just the instrument. Um, and that's one of the reasons why sometimes we use hydrogen instead of helium as hydrogen is cheaper. Um, even though it's explosive, it, it doesn't cost as much. So it's not just the weather instrument itself, it's it's also the gas that we put into the balloon um, that we have to buy to inflate it. That's a good question, but I wanna say it's somewhere right around $100 or so. Great. Well, I think we will let that be the last one since we're five, five minutes over. Um, thank you, especially to Tricia and Crystal for being patient and uh, getting on uh, so we can have our merits American Sign Language for today. And thank you, Jeff, for the great uh, presentation today. I got, we have, we got so many comments and excitement from the kids today. So um, thank you for sharing this information with us. For everybody else, let's see, I think next week we are, gosh, what do we have next week? Let me double check here. Um, 
we are talking about, let's see, crabs in Alaska on the 13th and dolphins on uh, Wednesday um, from one of our friends in Miami. So we have um, some exciting stuff coming up next week. We hope to see you there and we'll just talk to you next week. Thanks everybody. Bye Jeff. Bye-bye.